when I when I released it, and then people was ringing me like, "You're top ten, like you're on the top ten. No this is like yeah of, of the album sales, yeah." And because I, I, I done the most sales that day, that's how iTunes works. Whoever sells the most that day, this yeah, this that, yeah, and, yeah. and it's worldwide, isn't it? So worldwide, I was literally top ten, and I was just like, "Wow!" Then it kind of hit me like, a, and then I remember seeing something, and it said like, uh, uh, "If Allah, if, if if Allah gives you like, be scared. If Allah gives you everything in this world, like." You might have everything this goes. You might, you might, you might not have a place in the hereafter. Right. So I remember seeing that and I just ignored it. And I was kind of like, yeah, there's nothing really. Then, long story short, uh, my story. I think I've said it a lot of times. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Amazing. It's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. My sister just sent me a video one night. I was just literally just in my house. Um, it was like a couple months before Ramadan, and I was thinking to myself, how am I gonna get past Ramadan? Uh. Like in terms of, because I had so much uh, videos and stuff that I had to, that I, I was ready to drop, but I was thinking, don't drop it now. People are gonna think you're shaitan because Ramadan is coming up, right. isn't it? So I thought, drop it after Ramadan, but I need to work. How am I gonna go past Ramadan? How am I gonna get through Ramadan? I got 30 yes. days to get through get first. It. That's what I thought. I thought, I need to get through that first and then drop what I'm doing. I went from that mind state, yeah, or lie to my sister, like, May Allah bless her, man. Like, I mean, both of my sisters are both practicing in it. Yeah, Wallahi, man. I love them so much, man. They literally, uh, I couldn't thank. Obviously, f praise to Allah, alhamdulillah. But she sent me a video about music, idol talk, what it says. And I've always listened to the Quran, like when my mom's playing it and stuff, but I don't know what Allah's saying. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I used to always think like the, the Quran is probably just, I, I didn't really know what was being said. Yeah, so my sister sent me that video about music, this is that. And then it really touched me. I started crying. Was this, was this bef just before Ramadan? Just before Ramadan. Okay. Imagine now, this is one of the times I was thinking, oh, Ramadan's coming up. I actually started crying from the words of Allah. Like Allah writ for me that it was going to be the Quran that's going to change me. Like, Allah. You know what I mean? So it was a, it was a surah to Luqman when I, those who use idol talk to mislead people from the path. And I felt like I was misleading so many people because like even when I was going to places and I'm going with so many people that's in my area. So I'll be like, okay, I've got to go somewhere. Yeah. Like to a yeah, show yeah, or yeah. whatnot. And I'll go somewhere and it's like the whole you. area is coming with me. Like literally the whole area from the oldest to the youngest. And then now I started thinking well, after I heard the verse, I was like, those who use idol talk to mislead those from the path. Like I'm misleading so many of these people. Like they could be, what if they died? Like, while I'm going to these places, isn't it? Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, I uh, and then that really just made me, like, it, it got me really emotional. Allah's the best of planners. I literally just threw my hands up and said, said you know what? I'm gonna uh, uh, just go with it. And I made a video, just a little short video on my Instagram, like, Salaam Alaikum, brothers and sisters. Um, uh, uh, I said delete my I think I said something along the lines I said delete, can you whoever's got my videos can you please delete it this this that so then when I, I converted to Islam I only really family wise it was only me my mum and my sister so it was like a small family like not really no grandparents aunties uncles nothing like that cousins so it's just me my mum and my sister so I really really badly wanted to save them I felt like I've found this gem this amazing thing i have to save my mum and my sister so i go in the house and i'm like locking the door like look listen to me like trying to spread the message and my mum's drinking and i'm saying give me that pouring it down the sink this will take you to the hellfire mum just onto them onto them onto them but i think they felt like i was going mad at that stage like, Lord, I remember my mum, like, I don't know what's wrong with your brother, to my sister. My sister's like, yeah, you know, are you all, is everything okay, Ash? And in these early stages, I think I was a bit of a know-it-all. Like, read two books, think, felt like I knew everything. I was acting like I just graduated from Medina University. Just pr giving, them it, giving them it hard, walking around in my fold, but I was just on it. <laughs> but you know what? After a while, the more you learn, it's like the more comfortable and relaxed you become within your faith and it starts to change your character. The more I was learning, the calmer I became, the more polite I became, the more good manners I had. Till I remember my mum was um, watching a video in, in one of my DVDs from, um, um, the, it was Indian, not Zahir, no, Ahmed Didat. Ahmed Didat was debating a Christian and my mum's watching it saying, yeah, he's saying about Jesus, like, he's talking about Jesus. Like, I said, yeah, mum, like, the, the. she goes, for real, let me get my Bible out. So she got her Bible out and she's watching it. And I'm watching my mum from the corner and I remember my mum's like, nah, because the Muslim is debating a Christian. And my mum's saying, 
Why is a Christian shouting like that? And da, da, da. look at the Muslim just understand. Listen, can't listen to what the man's saying. But she's talking to the TV. She used to do that anyway. So she's talking to the TV. So I just thought I'm just going to leave her. And I just remember watching from the wall where the door is. And my mum's like, the Muslim, Ahmadi, that bless him. He's like, in the Bible, chapter 1, verse this, page that. Da, 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 da. Read what it says. They will be. And the Christian's going, and Jesus is the king of the kings. And the mum's saying, listen to what the man's saying. He's saying in the Bible. <laughs> So my mum's got her Bible and she's saying, it's right, it's right, it's right, he's right, he's right, he's right. And I just saw tears dropping down my mum's face. At that point, I just ran upstairs to my room. And I said, just bang to the car quick, like, Allah, please, 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 just, just make this, make this, just enter her heart, please, please. I ain't gonna, like, just give me this, give me this. And that day when I was going to Egypt, my mum said she wants to come to the mosque with me. She wants to spend the day with me before I go, she wants to come to the mosque. I said, I said, I got a goal. She's like, look, I want to come. I got my headscarf. I just want to come. Like, I want to spend the whole day with you. You're going to Egypt tomorrow. I said, all right, then come. So when she's come to the mosque, I said to my brother, look, you have to bring your wife. Cause my mum's coming. Bring your wife. Like my brother Shae, so he brought his wife. I said, take her. Let's go to Regent's Park. There's loads of different types of Muslims there, different races. I said, and she's gone in the woman's section with, with, with my friend's wife and then... And I phoned them after we finished the prayer to say, what, are you ready? Are they ready to go? He's like, yeah, they're ready. They're both ready. I said, all right, cool, meet you in the car park. She's like, why are you going to the car park? They're both ready. I said, what are you saying? He goes, yeah, he's saying your mum and your sister are both ready to take Shahada now. Wow. So I said, what? Phoned the imam. He was my private teacher, Ahmed Nazar, in Regis Park. I said, my mum's here. She, like, she wants to take Shahada. So he says, what about Egypt? Because he's the one who told me to go to Egypt. You still going? I said, yeah, but I remember just watching them in the office do it. I went to Egypt the next day. But that moment was like, I could just die now. Like, I'm red. That, that just was like, seeing my mum in there, like, saying them words and struggling. And I remember she was like, I'll take the name Mariam. And my sister was like, yeah, I'll take the name. I was like, this is mad. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, bro, at the end of the day, we praise people all the time. It's the yeah. most innate thing. What about Mo Farah when he was doing the 5,000 and 10,000 meters and he was winning in the Olympics? You go, yeah, amazing, standing ovation. Mm. You give him, a, you know, you applaud him. We praise people because we see certain attributes in them that we believe deserve praise, <clears throat> right? But these things are deficient and these things are not perfect and these things are limited. So what does that mean how we should praise Allah? So he's not limited and not deficient and he's not, you know, flawed. He has perfect names and attributes so what should it mean about our hearts and how we should praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do you see so that's a natural instinct and that's why people yeah. have misdirected worship isn't it everyone worships mm. everyone worships bro and that's why sometimes you don't need rational arguments you need these profound existential arguments which come from the Quran chapter 39 verse 29 I believe when Allah says consider the state of two people one man he's a slave to many masters and they're all arguing Another man, he's a slave to one master. Whose condition's best? Who? And in tests and trials, in darkness, there are treasures that exist there and they don't exist anywhere else. Like, they don't exist in light. You, you just can't find them. They're mm. just not created Powerful. in that environment. Mm. They only exist in trials and in hardships. And if you adopt a mindset of strength and reliance on Allah, you will find things in that cave that when you come out of it, and eventually every person will come out of it. No trial will last forever. But you will come out of that cave richer than when you came in. Happier than when you came in. And you'll even look back in that cave from the, from the light, looking back into it, being like, I miss, I miss some of my times in there. But if you were to explain to someone what you was going through, they would be like, what? How? Or you would even say to them, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the opportunity to not have been lost in that cave, in that darkness for as long as I was, I would, I would, not, I would rather stay in there. I'd rather have allowed that to take place. Because the personal development, the moments you have with Allah, the reality of the matter is, is that tests push you to a level that comfort doesn't. When Allah describes the believers, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةً Subhanallah, imagine this. Allah says they are the ones, the believers, who give for the sake of Allah. Charity. طيب, whatever they're given. And their hearts are wajila. Their hearts are trembling, afraid. Why? 
أنهم إلى ربهم راجعون because they're going to return to Allah. طيب. What does this mean? This means that they do a righteous deed, which is now giving charity for Allah تبارك وتعالى, and they are afraid. يعني they are afraid. Is this act of worship going to be accepted from me? That's how the believer is. He's in constant fear. And that's what motivates him to do better and to do more and to do more and to do more. But if you think that I'm the best, my deeds have been accepted, خلاص, you're never going to do anything. And that's why Allah, after he said that, you know, he says about them, أولئك يسارعون في الخيرات Those, those people, يعني, that Allah described, they are the ones who strive in خيرات, in goodness. And وهم لها سابقون, and they precede everyone to it. Because they have that trait of humility, and they always think that my deeds, I'm afraid it's not accepted, so they keep striving, they keep striving. So, They precede everyone when it comes to good, when you have that trait. So if you want to be ahead of everyone when it comes to goodness and khair and a'mal al-saliha, righteous deeds, you need to have that trait in order to get there. Sure, I think there's, there's, there, there are different sort of things you have to look at when you sort of decide in who you're going to learn from. Uh, one of the things is that you've got you to be careful who you learn from. Certainly. Because there's a, there's a statement of one of the, the tabi'in, one of the imams of the generation after the companions. And he said, "Inna هذا العلم دين فانظروا عمن تأخذون دينكم." This knowledge is that's your religion. You're going to worship Allah based on what that person tells you. So you be careful who you're going mm. to take. It. Be, just don't don't be like you know the Arabs. They have a really really beautiful expression. I love this expression. They call it "hatib layl," the person who collects firewood at night. It's an example they give or a proverb of someone who isn't really careful about what they pick up. You know, so this mm. guy's around going around the forest at night and he's got his, you know, he's got his hands out and he's just picking things up off the ground. He doesn't know he's picking up a scorpion, he's picking up a snake, he's picking up wood, he's picking up someone's leftover rubbish. He doesn't have a clue what he's doing. He's just, he's just sort of mm. blindly going around just picking things up. Uh, and they give that example for someone who isn't careful about where, what the information that they take in. So you do have to be pretty careful. You have to make sure the person, because... There's th- like the, the, the scholars say like there's two, there's two people that can really ruin your life, right? A doctor who doesn't know what he's doing mm. and a teacher who doesn't know what he's doing. Because it, those two people, they can seriously ruin your life. In a, but the doctor so can ruin your life and the teacher can ruin your akhirah. That's yeah. the mm. difference, you know? Um, I've, I've got, uh, it's a genetic problem. So I, I was born with it, but um, it's a degenerative uh, disorder. So it's, it's progressive and... Um, the doctors um, predict that I will eventually go blind. Pra- practically, um, what I can see, so for example, I can see shapes. I, I can't see any of your facial features. I could just see that um, you know your skin color, and uh, um, I think you're wearing a t-shirt. That's that's the sort of level of what I can see. Uh, when when you know that um, Allah is looking after you, uh, all these um, depressions and uh, all this lack of confidence they, they all go away because you know Allah is watching you. And you know uh, anything, any hardships you go through is not going a waste um, because um, Allah is, is rewarding you for those hardships. So w- when you know that it's not going a waste, uh, then it, it stops you from sort of having that sort of depression feeling. In fact, it, sometimes you might even be happy that you've got the disability. And that's what I had. Alhamdulillah, uh, I'm very happy with my disability. And um, it gives me something to look forward to in, in the day of Qiyamah that... I had this disability and, and you can put your hand up and, and say to Allah, I had sabr. So Actually, nobody can say they're perfect. Everybody's got sins that nobody else want to know. Like, n- like nobody else wants to know about. Like you got, everybody has sins in it that they're ashamed of. Everybody has certain weaknesses. But unfortunately, like <laughs> there's a difference between someone having that, that weakness and someone having that weakness and putting it in social media or advertising it. And I think that's where the issue is. Mm. Because bro, like, like Okay, metal and metal. And let's just say, like, for argument's sake, you might have an issue where you might be smoking, smoking cigarettes, smoking weed, smoking uh, a pipe shisha. Uh, I'm talking about the sin, whatever it may be. But, bro, no problem. Like, everybody, okay, inshallah, may Allah make it easy for you to come off that kind of sin because everybody sins and people sin in different way. But don't go out of your way exposing yourself. Like, there's no need for you to post. And I, the reason why I, I'm, I'm, I talk about this is because, you know, the Prophet said that my whole ummah is forgiven except for the ones that do sins and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conceals their sins and they go out of their way mm. to publicize their sins. Mm. Because when you publicize your sins, it's like you're challenging Allah. So mm. I put up a question. What would you do if you had 24 hours, hours yeah. to live, you know? And the, the reason why I put that, because it, 
as and soon as you see that question, you, you start thinking. Yeah. But everything that you answer is stuff that you should be already doing. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So people say, oh, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to make dua. So why aren't you praying more? Why aren't you making dua now? A similar question was posed to one of the companions or something. Mm-hmm. I can't really exactly remember the whole narration, but just a paraphrase. And they were asked like, w- w- like s- similar type of question. And the companions like, they don't. there's nothing more they, they, f- they would change or they, they would do. Wow. Because they're like they're doing everything. So yeah. when you hear someone say that, you just think, "Whoa, how yeah. far off am yeah. I?" Yeah, you know. Could yeah. you imagine? Could yeah. you imagine now? Because that should be your every day. Could you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, someone yeah. asking you that question, and you say to yourself, "There's nothing more I can do." Wow, <laughs> uh, that's mad. It's crazy. I can't even get my. I can't yeah. even. I can't. <laughs> we'll try I can't get my. But I always say to everyone, I kind of try and reiterate on my social media and whatnot. Is like, no matter what you're going through in life, pray. No matter what you're going through, Allah might throw you in the most crazy scenarios, pray. Because honestly, that gets you through so much adversity. Like, I remember when I was in university and I was studying, I used to, I used to get really stressed about exams. I don't know if obviously exam season's over, but I used to get so stressed about uni exams and whatnot. One thing I remember, I had an exam the next day, or I'm, I'm you know, about to take the exam. I'd go pray straight away as soon as I give my salams. It's like a big weight would fall off my shoulders. And I feel like I'm ready to tackle it. Like it's nothing for me now. I'll intention, intention. You know, straight up. What is your intention? What are you putting out there? You know, when it comes to Instagram, you know, are you trying to impress or are you trying to express? For me, I just express what I love doing, and you know, that's the main intention um, uh, to understand why you're doing it. You know, um, so many reasons. Instagram is a way to show off if you're doing it unknowingly or unconsciously. Uh, in in my opinion, to be able to express what you do and the reasons why you love it and how you can help people, you know, that's really what can fulfill you at the end of the day. You know, I say to Sam every, you know, a couple of times, I, I'm I'm just so excited to, to wake up. You know, I, I'm too inspired to sleep sometimes, you know, and he turns around to me and goes, that's a bit crazy, isn't it? And um, that's, 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 a f- that's how it is for me, you know, this, this, this profession that I do, you know, I love it because I know how much it can contribute to society, it can contribute to my industry, which then will leave me fulfilled. And it comes to, t- to the intention, you know, how can you grow it? Well, do, do what you love and express it and, and, and show that passion and the people will see it. And, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really come from the people, it comes from Allah. So he will put you on that platform if it's supposed to be for you and if your intentions are completely pure. Well, amazing. And it's really, really important as individuals, one of the greatest things that we can possess is emotional independence. And it's something that a lot of people lack, where their happiness and their contentment is so much, is controlled so much by exterior factors, even if they're mum, dad, brother, sister, husband or wife. You can't go through life that way, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't created human beings to fit your exact um, desires for who it is that you want or you want them to be a particular way. Life just doesn't go like that. And you need to be able to be independent emotionally and be able to stand on your own where your contentment is within yourself. No doubt you're not supposed to be a robot and anything happens to you in life and you shouldn't feel a way about it. But obviously there's levels, do you understand? So if you're in a situation where you have someone dear to you, someone perhaps in your household who's who's deviating away and is causing you a lot of distress, then care for them, make dua for them, show them love and compassion, but check yourself, check your intentions, and be wise in how you deal with these individuals. Everybody has their journey. Perhaps this individual who's struggling now may become better than you at a time. Just being an entrepreneur is a virtue for a Muslim. You can pray, you can go to Juma. you don't have to shave your beard, you don't have to shake these people's hands, you don't have to do these haram acts. And there's always going to be a pinch or a scratch that you have to go through, okay? Uh, people, they ask about working in banks. I've been asked that before. They ask about work, having uh, hair salons and barbershops. I used to be a barber. I used to cut hair when I was younger. And to, to become a certified barber, you have to learn how to shave a face. You cannot get a license until you actually shave someone's face. You have to learn how to trim eyebrows. You have to learn how to do ladies' hair, too, to be certified. So if I have an Islamic barbershop, what are the virtues of that? I can pray when I want to. There's no music being played. I don't have to deal with no haram things, credit cards, whatever the case is. There's no naked woman as the shampoo girl. We're not gambling. We're not selling guns or drugs. No pornography in my barbershop. It's a Muslim barbershop. Juma, the shop is closed. Eid, the shop is closed. People are reading, studying. 
women, sisters can come into the, 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 my barbershop with their young children. But how do I get certified until I do some things which are clearly haram? So sometimes you have to get a lesser of the two evils. How can a Muslim be a financial expert or an economist? How can the Muslims have their own la riba banks unless they know the system in and out? And you can't learn the system of riba in and out until you've actually been trained inside of the system. So living in Western countries, sometimes we have to realize that there are certain things, not all things, I said, certain things which are a necessity and certain things which are without a doubt it's bad, but it's things which are worse all right there's monsters and then they're what big monsters mm -hmm. and sometimes you can't always avoid a small monster so yeah. i'm not saying it's halal haram i'm just saying these things have to be taken into consideration and if you say no you can't shave with someone's face in the barber school okay no problem how can i become a certified barber i'm going to work in a barber shop and they're non-muslims laughing at people looking at women selling drugs and smoking weed in a barbershop. The sister comes in a barbershop with her young kids and she hears them talking about women and obscenities. So how can the Muslims open up their own places, let alone insurance? All that stuff you got to do to have your own business, which is clearly disliked or haram, whatever the thing may be. So the point is, is to establish certain things. Sometimes the Muslims must take the lesser of the two evils. So to have a successful YouTube channel that's thriving and flourishing, as we say, bubbling, people are watching it, it's viral. There are certain things that you're just going to have to go through. And if we choose to say, no, it's haram, this is haram, you can't have your own barbershop, the Muslims can't have the barbershop. We're living in a fantasy world. Right. We're living in a fantasy world, and in 10 or 20 years, the Muslims aren't going to have anything. And we're going to be dependent upon the non-Muslims. And when we're dependent on them, we have to do really haram things. So instead of you shaving someone's beard once to get your certification, to get a job, you're now shaving your beard every morning. Wow. You pick your poison. That's powerful. You pick your poison. The relationship that I had with my daughter, it's, it, I would never have that with my boys, bro. Like, I, like and any father listening to this that has daughters, especially... You know, we, ha we like live in this culture where a lot of guys, a lot of families, subhanAllah, maybe not so much now, but no, it still happens. Everybody wants boys. Mm. You, you understand? I mean, like yeah. we know like back in the days, people would like, you know, bury their daughters alive, subhanAllah, and, and people are upset, you know, when uh, you, if you have like too many daughters and it, like, it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot of pressure for the, for the daughter-in-law, you know, like, oh, she's not giving him a son and all this, all this ridiculous mumbo jumbo that we hear. And I used to always think like, I used to always th think about, I never used to ask for a daughter. I was very traditional in, in, in my way of thinking. And I, I tell you why I never used to ask for it. I used to always ask Allah for boys. And the conversation I would have with Allah was, look, if I have boys, they, uh, you know, they get married, they grow up, they find their wives, they get married, they leave ha the house, it's all good. I'm so, you know, like they can just take care of themselves, right? They can handle themselves. They can handle yeah. themselves, yeah. right? So I don't have to worry about that. Right. But if I have a daughter, and I used to, I literally used to have this conversation with Allah, that I will love her and cherish her and treat her like a princess for her, for her entire life. And the analogy that I used to give was, and I used to always say that, and then eventually she will... Take your time, sorry. bro. That's fine. And I used to always say, eventually she'll, you know, she'll get, she'll have to get married, and you know, whether we have a say in who she gets married to or whatever, and um, like we won't know who she gets, like we won't have any control over it, you know, whether he's a good guy. Oh, Sorry. Can role models? Why does your role model have to be Kim Kardashian? Like Aoud Billahi, this woman, like how did she become famous? Everyone knows because of her tape. Do we have to be up front Because these are our sisters And our daughters That are going to grow up That are watching Keeping up with Kardashians Why does, why does, why does our role model Have to be Cardi B Why does our role model Have to be Rihanna Or 50 Cent Or Eminem Or whoever it may be Or Dr. Dre Or whoever it may be Why can't our role models Be Khadija Radiallahu anha a successful businesswoman, a righteous businesswoman who supported the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through thick and thin, who had his back. Why can't our role models be like Aisha radiallahu anha, a scholar of Islam? 
the third person to, to, to narrate, I think Allah the, 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 the most ahadith was Aisha radiallahu anha. Why can't our role models be Um Umar, um, um Amara, Nusayba radiallahu anha, who I named my daughter after, who was a nurse, who was a nurse in the time of the, in the, in the, time of the battle of the Prophet sallallahu when he went to, 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 to battles. And she was, uh, subhanAllah, at the time when in, in the battle of Uhud, when they were being, uh, when the, the, the Muslims were on the back foot, she, she, subhanAllah, was encouraging the Sahaba to stand up and fight. SubhanAllah. Such a strong, uh, such a strong character. Wow. Such a strong personality. Why can't our women be, why can't our women look up to role models like that? Shall I tell you a true story? Before I became Muslim, I was offered an opportunity to take a line. And that line was pulling in a couple of bags a week, thousand pounds. I never really spoke about this, but I'm prepared to do so on this podcast today. And my, op my, my option was take the line or become Muslim. And I chose Islam. And I upset some people. But I could have handled it. No problem. That lifestyle, no problem. Anyone can live like that. A scumbag. Anyone can shot. Anyone can pull a trigger. Anyone can pull a knife. If you've got a big, big enough mouth, you can make anyone afraid of you, yeah? Especially if you pop one off next to their car, like, boom, what are you going to do? Boom, boom, boom. They'll get shook, man. Put his tyres out, yeah? Shoot his windows out. People get scared of you if you act like a big man, yeah? Do you know what's really hard? To pray Fajr. To get up and worship your Lord, Allah. To be kind to your neighbour. To cook food for them. To go knock your neighbour's door. To cut your old lady's grass down the road. This is hard graft. This is how Muslims are. You know, to, to do the real difficult things is what takes you to Jannah. Because what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surrounded in Jannah was difficult. And what takes you to Jahannam is easy. Bro, me and you right now, if, you, if we were people with no iman, no fear of Allah, <coughs> we could easily go set up sank up and make money. I could make money like that, yeah. doing it haram. Anyone could do it haram. Here's a mindset. Here's an attitude. And I think life is all about having the right attitude. And I've spoken in previous podcasts about the attitude of gratitude which is the absolute antidote to feeling depressed and overwhelmed. And do I feel depressed and overwhelmed at times? Of course I do. I'm a real person. I am a, have a real life and thing ha things happen to me that weren't on my itinerary for that day, right? Um, but then the, the secret lies in how quickly you connect back to your values. How quickly do you connect back to your real attitude? So... If anything happens to you in that moment, yeah, you're not yourself. You're reacting like this, and it's it's very natural and, hu and human to do so. What, but the difference between people with the right attitude and a strong attitude is that they come out of that dip very quickly, and others may just use that as an excuse or a reason to just go further and further and further. And we know examples of people who just the smallest thing that will happen to them, that's it. The day's ruined. They can't do anything else and uh, and they go into a, a deep uh, dive. Do you know this mutual respect thing? I think that a lot of issues can happen in relationships, in marriages, in friendships because people don't respect each other. Mm -hmm. And what they do instead is they think bad of the other person all the time. Like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. They're not doing that, they're not doing that, they're not yeah. doing that. But once, once it, in any relationship, even in a friendship, it, if a person believes that they're never doing enough, um, that's such a good way to be. If if the other person is thinking they're not doing enough, we spoke about this before, didn't mm -hmm, we? Mm -hmm. But the, the 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 trick is though that both people have to be thinking like that. Yeah, certainly. One person can't be like, oh, do you know, what? I'm just not doing enough in this marriage. But the other one's like, oh, yeah, he's not doing enough in this marriage. Then it's like you're then this network will yeah, work. Yeah, but yeah. if he's thinking I'm not doing enough in this marriage and she's thinking I'm not doing enough in this marriage, the marriage will be so beautiful because they're always both trying harder of to course. impress each other and do more. Mm -hmm. So uh, the story that relates to that, I can't remember, I think it was like a story of a scholar of the past or something. And he was outside um, cleaning up. He was cleaning the yard, he was cleaning the house or something. I can't remember, right? And it's, it's mad because what happened is the wife was so embarrassed that her husband was cleaning the house because she was like, I um, like why am I letting my husband clean the house when he's going out working this at the other and so she was like, like trying to get the thing off him like let me clean up and he was like no way I feel em he felt embarrassed that he's that the, he felt embarrassed that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to help out around the house and he ain't doing enough to help out around the house now imagine a situation where that's every marriage 
Bruv, he thinks he ain't doing enough, she thinks she ain't doing mm. enough. She's embarrassed, he's embarrassed. Mm. Bruv, they both always be like, no, yeah, no, no, I'm real, doing this. No, no, I'm doing this. Like what I mean? Like, like bro, how beautiful yeah. is that, bro? Because, but the problem is nowadays, it's like, well, wow, like, he just did that, yeah. and then he caught, yeah. like, what? So I'm just meant to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is true, bro, because a lot of men take advantage, a lot of women take advantage. But if both were yeah. like, I, I'm not doing enough, imagine the levels, bro. You just be always be on top. On, on your your relationship would be always A1 because you'll be like, no, 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 I'll do that. I'll take care of this. No, no, I'll take care of it. Like, baby's crying in the middle of the night. I'm yeah, going to get up yeah, for you. Course, no, no, I'll course, get up for you. You course, sleep, course, you got work course. in the morning. Nah, but you've been doing course, it all day. Course. Imagine, bruv, the, you're beefing to, yeah. no, you've been up all day I'll with him. I'm going to do it, yeah. Nah, you've been at work. I'll do it. I'll just, amazing, yeah. man. Someone said to someone, like, oh, how are you? Are you okay or something? And they said, they said, I've got a roof over my head and I've got food on my table. I'm, I'm sorted you know There's I mean? a hadith of the Prophet mm. He said that uh, Whoever wakes up uh, Whoever wakes up And is safe in his house mm. Number one uh, Is healthy in his body Yeah So he has So he has a house So he has a roof over his head He is healthy And he is safe in his body And he is also has uh, Something to eat for the, for the day That it is as if The whole world Has been brought uh, Forth to him like, yeah. This is amazing yeah? This one brother um, before I went on Hajj, he gifted me some money. And this was like a random thing, like, usually brothers don't like, just give you money before you go on Hajj, like, usually, well, enjoy your Hajj, may Allah accept it, etc. But this brother gave me money. Yeah, and I was thinking, how can I use this money to to benefit him as well? Yeah, because you can take the, mo- you can take the money and use it and buy some clothes for your family, etc., etc. I was thinking, my, maybe I can maximise this and use this for something good. So I bought my flip-flops that I'm going to wear when I do my walking and stuff like that. And I bought some some sketches. We're doing a lot of plugging here, man. I bought some yeah. sketches. Yeah, mentioned about four. Yeah. Already, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I went to um, outlet sketches outlet and I bought some some flip flops like that, thick this thick, and they were like so good. Like, and I used it throughout my hajj. There's another thing I got to tell you about what happened. Yeah, but so I, I bought it. and I actually used these flip flops all the way throughout my hajj. Wow. All my walking, I did in it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. I like, accept it from the brother, you know. I mean, so he would have got a lot of reward, man, inshallah, inshallah. you know, for the for the sketches that you yeah. bought. You and uh, I walked in and, you know, uncovered uncovered her face and just... And she looked so peaceful. And just, like, the little chubby, <laughs> fatty Khatija that I knew... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my god, and uh, so we started doing we started doing the horse on Subhanallah, and uh, you know when I I mentioned that I used to worry about having daughters, right? So we did her horse and it, and it was like the like the like I said the hardest thing, and then we came to her hair and we were like, what do we do now? She had long hair, right? The little munchkin, and. Uh, the the sister that was with us, she said that you know it's the sunnah to braid the hair, like to put to braid it in three, uh, three like plants or whatever. So, alhamdulillah, she was there to do that because me and Ahmed wouldn't have a clue. Uh-huh. So we braided her hair, and uh, you know made it look really pretty for her mum, and we put her in a, in her shroud and we put her into a little coffin. And, uh, and as I was talking and as we were doing the ghusl. I kept stopping and starting it, stopping and starting. And I said to Amr, I said, SubhanAllah, Amr. I used to always ask Allah, like, not to give me daughters. Because I never knew where they would end up. I was always worried that that process of me getting them prepared to get married. And then I said, and look at this. I'm putting her in her shroud. Almost as if I'm putting her in her wedding dress and i'm s- and and you know we're seeing her off putting her in a coffin almost as if we're seeing her off to a final resting place but the final resting place that i used to worry about like who's going to take care of her is with allah oh, okay. <laughs> you know you know subhanallah that allah's like almost said to me like don't worry about it you used to worry about where your daughter's going to end up. You used to worry that the guy that she ends up with, her husband, like, is he going to be able to give you the same care, love and attention that you would as a father? So now we're taking her 
and she's returning to us and she is with the best being looked after by the best but when i see my community destroying the position of the muslims how can i go to my local councillor how can i go and stand and speak to the politicians and tell them islam is the right way when most of the criminals are muslims or at least a good portion in my area at least where i live are Muslims. The people bringing the drugs in are Muslims. The people selling the drugs are Muslims. And the drugs cause most of the other crimes in my area. The people who rob cars, who break windows, who, who burgle houses, it's for what? Drugs. Because only the lowest of society are prepared to do that. It's very rare you find like a, you know, a legit man with a suit, with yeah. a good education going around burgling houses, right? Yeah. You ever seen an educated man burgling a house? I never. Never. You never see a man roll up in a suit and go and burgle a house, right? Yeah. It's always ones in a track suit with track marks on his arm. Yeah, walking around like his eyes are like that and his teeth are falling out. It's him. Why? Because he's a drug user or he's, a, uh, he's an addict of some description. And the reason he's an addict is because uh, his name's Mo. Mo shot in. But really his name's Mohammed. Mm. And Muhammad's got gear, he's got brown. He's shot in a nice bit of brown. Yeah, yeah, come. And he'll take things instead of money. He'll take a TV, he'll take a camera, he'll take a phone, he'll take something else instead of the thing. This is a problem. The Muslims need to clean our areas up. This is not something the police are going to do. We're told in paradise that a wife will be raised up, if her husband is above her in paradise, she'll be raised up to his level. And if she's above him in paradise, he'll be raised up to her level as an honor uh, f for the two of them. That shows you that it's very rare that husband and wife are on the same level in terms of Iman at exactly the same time. It can happen, but it's not the, you know, very, very common that you get this disparity. And sometimes it's really big, like someone just started practicing and the other one's not really practicing at all. So some things I think are really important. I think, first of all, the one who started practicing needs to see their responsibility to be to help their spouse, not to have a go at them. It's not about that I've changed and you haven't. It's more like, okay, how can I get you now to experience this sweetness of Iman? Iman has a sweetness, right? Sure. Iman is very sweet. It's, yeah. it's sweeter than anything. It has a halal, it's sweetness. And if you want them to taste that sweetness, then it's the it's the shafaqa. I don't know, like, you know, you're... You, it's that really caring about them. It's that real care for a person. That should be what's motivating you. Even generally, the way you deal with non-practicing Muslims should be one of care, a way of like your motivating thing should be care and consideration. And I, I really want this person to taste the sweetness of Iman. And I want to be better. And I recognize where I came from. I recognize that I wasn't born, I mean, personally, I wasn't born a Muslim, um, yeah. at least in terms of the way my parents raised me born upon the fitrah but my parents raised me as, as a non-muslim i accepted islam and when i first accepted islam i wasn't practicing islam and i started practicing maybe three four years after i became muslim so for me if i can't remember what that was like and i can't remember the grace of allah and the blessing of allah that made me change and made me made me become something that is better than that than i was right there i think ultimately that that's it's only by remembering that that i can actually reach out to somebody and help them and a spouse should be even easier because there should be somebody that you have that love for anyway. So it's it's really easy for you to have that care for them and really want them to change. So it's going to take patience. And I think that it's really important people don't see it as a short-term thing. That look, I've told them three times, four times now, how long did it take you, the person who's saying that, how long did it take you to start practicing? I say for me, three years, maybe even four years. And I'm, And how could I then expect that person that a week or a day or or three times or four times when it took me three to four years. You see what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's right, you know, listen, Allah says in the Quran himself, you know, if you are grateful, I shall increase you. And myself and Sam, we used to, um, in our very, very first shop back in 2014, we used to close the shop just to go up the road to pray and come back. And I've done so ever since. And now we have eight salons. You know, if that's not a, 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 a something to believe. Eight, eight salons, guys. <laughs> You know, if, if you are not taking that as a message on board, then, you know, you don't have hope, you know, and you need to step out on faith. You need to not give up. You need to not give in. And it comes down to one simple thing. Do you have a dream? Do you have a goal? You know, because if you are waking up or even if you're going to sleep and have no motivation to get up, 
in the morning. You know, sometimes I can't even sleep at night because I'm too excited to wake up and continue with whatever goal or project or dream that I am trying to achieve. You know, it's something that the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam advised us against sort of being alone. Um, obviously the shaitan loves to attack an individual in those circumstances and many individuals find it hard to spend time alone. They always have to be around company. They can't be at home. They always have to be out doing something. But it's important to be able to enjoy your own time. It's important to be able to, that, again, that sort of comes back to that emotional independence, that lack of needing someone, of needing people. There's an advice that um, Jibreel alayhi salam gave to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, he gave him five advices and um, from amongst those advices, I don't want to, I don't want to quote it incorrectly, um, but a person's honor, their dignity, is in being free from the need of people. So I'll, just because perhaps maybe you're someone who experiences um, negative thoughts when you're alone, never shy away from being alone. Challenge yourself to spend time alone. Challenge yourself to think in a positive manner when you're by yourself and be productive. Sometimes I'm by myself um, and I'll be scrolling on Instagram for a long time and start feeling down. But it's, it's, I feel like that's the punishment of wasting time. Ideally, marital problems should be completely contained between husband and wife. And they should even be contained away from the kids as much as possible. So your children ideally shouldn't know or see that there's any problem between mom and dad. That's in an ideal sense. Now, I know there's times that's not practical, but it should be our standard that we aspire to. It shouldn't be that we aspire to, you know, sometimes we say keep it within the four walls of the house. But in all honesty, for in an in in Islamic sense, it's more about keeping it within, you know, the small space that's between husband and wife. And that's why even when some of the scholars uh, commented on the ayah, that abandon them in their bed, some of them said it just means for him to turn around or for her to turn around. Some of the scholars said see, this I is see. for men and women, okay, yeah. that it just means to just turn around. Because if you go sleep on the sofa, your kids start to know that mom and dad are not getting on. Of course. Um, or if it's like a big thing that, you know, why is dad sleeping on the sofa? Why is mom moved out and gone back to her parents house you know they it, it affects the kids massively mm. and husband and wife are gonna fight but i tell you one thing that i always think is really um, profound husband and wife have an inbuilt ability to forgive each other allah placed mawadda and rahma affection and mercy between husband and wife in a way that is it's an ayah from the ayat of allah it's a sign it's a miracle from the miracles of allah the way that allah put affection and love between husband and wife they have an ability to forgive each other and overlook each other's faults that other people who are external to that relationship don't have so what happens you get the mother-in-law involved father-in-law gets involved kids get involved they don't have that same ability and that same that same gift from allah to be able to overlook and forgive so problems last much longer than they need to husband and wife have let it go but the mother hasn't let it go the father hasn't let it go the kids might even be affected by it. If they're young, it might just be an effect where they feel sad about it. They don't feel, you know, they feel that mom and dad don't get on or they feel unsettled in themselves or insecure in themselves. If they're older, the kids might even be involved and be like, I'm on mom's side, I'm on dad's side. Mm. It's so important to try and contain those issues so that the husband and the wife, the only people who really know what's going on is them and everybody else might see the odd thing but it's not it's not on public display imagine an iphone fell from the sky yeah and i picked up this iphone and i said to you this iphone created itself and it just fell from the sky he said what would you say and i said i'd think you're a madman he goes okay so he said if you think the idea of an iphone creating itself is mad then what do you think of the idea of a human being creating itself is something that we can't even create, yeah? Humans cannot create human beings. Humans can create iPhones, yeah? Something so complex that we, we can't replicate the human body, yeah? You're willing to say that that was just created, just came. And I thought, do you know what? It's a very good point. You think about it. Think about how complex that iPhone is, yeah. man. When you actually think about it, like, even the idea of that 
creating itself is is fairly far fetched when you think about it's it. Impossible. It's impossible. How on earth do we think that the human, you know, being the human existence yeah. was just it just happened? I've made so much da'a I've made honestly I've made da'a even whilst I was walking around the Kaaba with with Abu Bakr my friend you know and I even made da'a for them to be there with me at one point walking around the Kaaba together yeah but it's having good thoughts about Allah because Allah is the best of planets and Allah guides whom he wishes yeah now it'd be crazy for me to say you know what my parents are going to become Muslim one day because I don't know I don't know I don't know if they're going to become Muslim one day I don't know it's their complete decision and their open um, decision to to choose whatever they choose. Now, obviously, it's ideal for me for them to become Muslim, and I make sincere dua that they become Muslim. Inshallah, I mean, may Allah guide them. I mean, may Allah guide them. But you know, it's their complete decision. And but it would it would be a massive step. It would be. Do a you think step. a lot about the afterlife and about how you know if they were Muslims yeah, that's, that's, and you'd spend time with them in yeah. Jannah? Inshallah. That's one thing I always think about. One thing I always think about. But again, it's who who of Allah, Allah guides. And you know, I was thinking to this day, even if it gets to the last point in their life, and they take the shahada, I would be happy. That's that's how that's how content I am because I have good, I'm having good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa taala. And if I don't have that, then I'm always going to be negative. I'll think negative about my parents. Why are you not becoming Muslim, etc., etc. Et then it's just going to become crazy. But if I think good of Allah and I think good of my parents, and I say, you know what, my parents are my parents. They have their own free will. They can do whatever they want. But I will make du'a for you. And that's it. It's as simple as that. But again, if I if I go into that mentality where I think, you know what, what are they doing? Why are they not Muslim yet? Then I'm going to start thinking ill of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because at the end of the day, it's Allah who's guiding them. It's not me. I might be the tool for their guidance, but I'm not the one who guides them. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, we know that in the Quran, Allah says, indeed, Allah is with the patient. Allah, of course. And the way that we can do that is by tapping into, you know, our, our inner gift and, and that of which, you know, Allah has granted us, whatever it may be, your passion. You know, and that's why I will always say to someone, you know, who comes to me for advice is, you know, don't chase your pension, but chase your passion. You know, I know there are so many people that dislike their jobs and, you know, dis maybe dislike their jobs or dislike their lifestyle and change it. You need to change it. It's up to you. You have to change the way that you're living or you have to change your job to a point where you know that you're going to be doing something that you love day in, day out. And it's it's about tapping into that inner gift because whatever you do, you know, externally, you know, whatever you're wearing or whatever it is, you're, imagine it as it, imagine it fully as a gift. You know, that, that outer wrapping is going to be you know, dressed so nice with a ribbon and beautiful paper and everything on the outside material is really nice. But it's the inner, inner gift that you want to tap into and be able to, you know, capitalize on that and work on that. And that will be the, 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 the sweetness of the fruit that we can have day in, day out. And, and once you're doing that, you, you really don't have to be worried about a thing, you know, like... I would cut hair for free. I would teach people for free. I would do this flying, this, that, and never. I would do it for free. But guess what? You need to be able to do it so well that they will pay you for it. I think first of all, with regard to, to productivity, I think there are two essential things. There are probably more, but there are two really essential things. And actually, it's a beautiful hadith, which is, I think it is the hadith of productivity, is that the Prophet Sallallahu said uh, in his hadith, Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk, this is that's productivity. There is no better statement of how to be productive than that. Work hard for what's going to bring you benefit in the dunya or the akhirah. And seek Allah's help for it. Because if it's not for Allah's help, you're not going to achieve it. You can work 24 hours a day and achieve nothing. You can work half an hour a day and achieve everything that you hope for if Allah helps you. Work for what's going to benefit you. And that tells you it's from you. That's not like, I'm going to sit down and wait for Allah to make me a scholar. I'm going to sit down and wait for Allah to make me a millionaire. I'm going to, no, I'm going to work for what's going to benefit me. I'm going to work hard for it. But at the same time, I'm going to realize I'm not going to get it without Allah. I'm going to seek help from Allah. And don't be defeatist. Don't say, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. And don't be defeatist. And don't say in the end of the hadith, and don't say, if I only did this, 
If I only did this, it would have been like this. If I only did this, it would have been like this. Because if opens the door or if only opens the door to the work of the shaitan. What a hadith. I love this hadith. This is amazing. This is the, this is the hadith of productivity. We need more female doctors. We need more female gynecologists. We need, we, we need more female teachers. We more, like Muslimat. Islam doesn't limit you. Rather, it protects you. Rather, it gives you that insurance. Where, subhanAllah, look at the society that we live in now. Women are sexualized. Women as women are sold, and let's be real and frank up here. Women are sold and 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 and, and, are, and are presented as sex symbols. Actually, women doing buff li- butt lifts and this lift and that lift to look to, to look like a spe- to look like how society wants them to look like. Like that's that's twisted, Akhi. But but when we look at Islam, how women have have protected Islam and how you know you're not judged about how you look, but you're judged at what you have to offer. Oh, it's oppressive. Mm. Like subhanallah How backward have we become Like look at akhi, social media akhi. Look at these women akhi. You know they, they go into Turkey And they go into countries To get lifts of all sorts yeah, And they're mm. dying Just because they want Their, their bum Astaghfirullah To be in a certain way Like Allah, we have to be real And even now men Now because now men akhi, Because they need to To, 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 uh, to adhere to, to the pressures of society And what are norms Now they're getting fillers Subhanallah In their, in, in their private parts And what not Wallah, and this is how shaitan He comes and he whispers To the sons of Adam To change And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Says in the Quran And this is how they change The creation of Allah oh, I'm not happy with my nose I want my nose to be this, 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 this shape I'm not happy with the skin color I want to be that color I'm not happy with my ears I want my ears to be, I'm, I, want dip, I want dimples in my skin Akhi, Subhanallah How is this up, How is this empowering women? Mm. This is enslaving women, Akhi. Mm. Enslaving women to the to the social norms of society that we deem as beautiful and this in order for a woman to be beautiful, this is what she has to have and this is what she has to possess. But no, Islam has come to protect the woman from this stuff. Don't be a slave to society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting you from the wolves out there, from the thirsty men. Mm. You know, subhanahu from the thirsty brothers, subhanAllah. Mm. It's deep, Akhi. and you know what? But because of our because of our limited, uh, you know, insight and our our limited minds, we automatically. Oh, Islam wants to you know cut off my wings. It doesn't want to let me fly and do my thing. Mm. 